Good day, this is Terry DeFazio, and you're watching Dial It Up. Our guests today are Representatives Mark Higley from the District of Orleans Lamoille mm -hmm. and Representative Paul Lefebvre from Essex, Caledonia, and Orleans counties. Good to have you guys on. Thank uh, you. Before we start, I'm just going to mention that these are going to be taking place every few weeks with different legislators, senators, and representatives. And I need to give a shout out to Vicki Strong because she's the one that really set this up. So nice. thank you, Miss Vicki. Uh, uh, these are open-ended questions, and like I said, pipe in any time you want. What is your opinion of what's going on in Montpelier right now? Well, you want me to start, Paul? Sure, go right ahead. <laughs> um, well, uh, I've, I've said this in other um, uh, publications and so on, that uh, I think the Zooming process that we're going through, we, we started it last year in mid-March and you know finished up in September. Now we're back at it again with Zooming. Um, I think it's a it's a very poor process for good public input, uh, good input put from uh, lobbyists as well, which uh, um, you know they're they're critical when it comes to uh, uh, major bills. Uh, you know I can think of uh, you know the Farm Bureau, the Forest Products Industry, any of these that uh, that want to have a say. It's a, it's a tough it's a tough racket to uh, to to zoom and 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 get your your points across and and I really feel uh, for the uh, new legislators as well, the first-time legislators that are just coming on, um, to miss that initial swearing in and getting to know uh, other legislators on a, um, on, a, on a personal basis. When you can sit down and have a cup of coffee with them, that's a whole lot different than staring at them in a Zoom screen. So uh, from that perspective, I, I think it's tough. Uh, I, would, I would like to say that I've heard other legislators say that that they don't like these either and it's just my opinion but i think that it, it, it eliminates too much human contact yeah. and but anyways what's your what's your take on what's going on in montpelier paul well i would agree with marcus what he had to say about zoom when the zoom there's no there's no possibility or an opportunity to be informal with people to talk to them in the hallways or at the cafeteria and get a reading as basically how they feel about certain bills i mean we all are down there to kind of do something so we have to try to figure out how to work with one another and it's very difficult to do that on Zoom. Uh, and, but also, I think the, uh, the larger issue here is uh, we're seeing a, a more and more of an attempt to consolidate power in Montpelier. Uh, this, the latest example was the uh, exec two executive orders the governor tried to pull off. And, uh, you know, in terms of he can, uh, he can do that under the... Uh, Constitution to reor reorganize the uh, departments and uh, branches of government, but in both cases it was really, uh, especially the one dealing with the uh, uh, district commissions in Act 250, to try to eliminate them by a governor by a governor order by the order by the governor. To me, it was just you know it was it was way outside his his purvey. The legislatures they had to set to, to 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 make to make policy. And uh, th this, these orders, it's either take it or leave it. You don't, you can't debate them. It's yeah, yay or nay or not, and you have 90 days to do it. So I don't like that type of government. Mm. I, I'm siding with you guys on this. I'm, I'm thinking that um, even with, for example, banks are not letting you in the lobbies now. You have to do everything through a window or do it online, and I think it takes away our yeah. ability to be human and interact in a in a social way. But that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, have you been hearing from your constituents regarding state mandates, and how do you feel about these state mandates? Well, what I've been hearing from my constituents is um, they're, of course, everybody's everybody's tired of the pandemic and, and what's required of them uh, at this time, and, 
it's we're coming coming upwards of a year now, and uh, they're <coughs> they're more than ready to get back to um, uh, some form of normalcy. Uh, not having the government uh, tell them at every step what they have to do, and um, so yeah, they're they're definitely getting tired of it. I think people are very nervous that uh, there's going to be a gov government mandate for vaccination. That's the, that's the kind of emails I am getting, uh, asking me not to support any mandate uh, requiring uh, vaccination. Uh, I happen to believe in vaccinations. I've already had one, as it's, and I'm going to get the second shot. But I don't like the government. I don't like any government telling people that they have to do something, especially when I think it's up to their own. You know, it's, it, I think getting getting a vaccination, I can see it in both uh, in religious and philosophical terms, and I think we should uh, the, a citizen should have the right to say no. I, that's not for me. Well, you know, I'm glad you you said that <laughs> because that leads right into my next question, and you may have already answered it, but you can answer it again if you like. How do you feel about uh, the Vermont House Bill H two thirty eight, which seeks to eliminate the religious exemption for vaccines? I'll well, oppose it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll yeah. oppose it too. And I, I talked to you earlier, Terry, about um, I was on GovOps years back when uh, uh, the legislature did away with the philosophical exemption. Mm -hmm. There always used to be the philosophical and religious. And there was a uh, constitutional law attorney, Cheryl Hanna, who taught at the Vermont Law School and came in time and time again to our committee to uh, dis discuss the constitutionality of removing the um, philosophical and not removing the religious and, and she stated that that was uh, totally unconstitutional. Uh, so again here we are after removing that one uh, looking to um, remove the religious. You know I'm not sure how many folks actually use the religious after the philosophical uh, was removed but again there's no litmus test for uh, religion uh, so all you had to do was say that it was a relig religious exemption um, so yeah, I'm really concerned, and like Paul, I've I've received uh, numerous very <laughs> uh, dis, uh, disappointed um, emails in regards to uh, what's being what's being proposed down there for doing away with vaccinations. And there was another bill to allow 16 through 18 year olds to get the vaccination without their parental uh, permission. Uh, so yeah, there's some concerning stuff that's happening. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would tend to agree. Um, is there is there any legislation uh, being introduced that addresses mask use or non-use? I don't understand the question. Well, is is a in your opinion has anybody come in and said you know we need we need to actually rather than just mandate we need to legislate this? Has anybody introduced that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, right. I haven't seen it either, Terry. Okay, no. because if it, if it's a mandate. I, I was under the impression it really is not that enforceable. If it's a law, it's enforceable, but if it's a mandate, it isn't. I'm not sure of how that works. We're operating now under an emergency <coughs> order, uh, both uh, an executive emergency order that uh, uh, has, uh, you know, it, I don't know what, how much teeth it has, but a lot of people cite it now on their doors into a big, uh, commercial establishments. They say it's been mandated that you have to wear a mask to step. And, you know, so I think it's uh, the, gov the governor has not quite taken the, that full step, but I, but I think within the order itself it's implicit that this is what we want you to do and we hope as good citizens you will comply. That's as far as it's gone, as far as I know. I don't know anyone who's been arrested or cited <laughs> for not wearing a mask. No. Yeah, um, and, you know, there was a town, and I wish I could remember the name of the town, in southern Vermont right on the mass border who has said we're not, we're not going to, uh, comply with this with this uh, governor's yeah emergency yeah, yeah, uh, whatever I can't remember the name of the town. I won't, I I can't either. I, I have I, I know you're right though. There was mm -hmm. a town down there. I think that shows a lot of guts, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, are you aware of a study? Now, I just by this the, the next couple of questions are going to be uh, that I received by email. Are you aware of a study that was published by UVM and co-authored by Mark Levine this last fall? And it found that mask use increased the probability of COVID infection. It also found that contact with children did not increase the probability of infection to the children. Uh, I'm not, Terry. I'm not aware of that study. Okay. When was it done? Last fall, evidently. Th this person, I wish I, I had uh, cited the person, but um, it was an email question that came in. 
Well, uh, Dr. Levine, Levine has been so <coughs> steadfast in his uh, support of wearing masks. I'd be surprised that he supported uh, the findings of such a study, but I haven't seen it, and I haven't heard people refer to it as reasons why they don't have to wear a mask. Yeah, okay. And um, what legislation, uh, right now, what legislation do you feel is the most important for Vermont uh, that you guys are working on at this time? Well, I would say that, uh, and I expressed this right to the speaker initially, that uh, because of the uh, Zooming, uh, which, which I don't feel is uh, conducive to good public input, uh, we should uh, basically try to deal with the, the COVID issues and the federal money that's coming in again. Um, I don't really think that's happening. I'm starting to see, you know, whether it's gun control issues in the Senate and uh, uh, other things in the House that are taking up time. Um, so um, I, I wish uh, that it was the case that we only dealt with the uh, COVID, COVID issues at this time. Okay. I'd like to see a, as short a session as possible for the same reasons that Mark outlined. Uh, it's, as I say, it's, it's really a lot of work to do uh, to legislate from home. Uh, it, uh, you're, you're just stuck in this cubicle and you're not meeting people and you're not getting a sense of how things are going. And uh, I, I, I don't like it. I, I try to make the best out of a bad situation, but I don't want to aggregate it any further by going on and on. And I, I would rather get it get over, get do the business we have to do to protect the state's finances and especially the small businesses. And, um, and uh, hopefully by another year, we will be able to go back to the state house and do our work as usual. And, and if I could, sure, Terry, ahead, another, yes, another concern for me is uh, uh, there's been concerns over the past uh, few bienniums in, in regards to the number of bills that are being introduced. And I would have thought that, you know, during this, this COVID crisis, uh, that, that that would have slacked off a little bit. But uh, lo and behold, uh, I think we're, what, over 500 bills that are, uh, you know, being uh, drafted up and proposed. And, uh, you know, that, that to, to me is, uh, is, a, is a real concern. Again, you know, it all depends on, on which ones are taken up. Um, I asked in my committee uh, the end of last week, um, another uh, fellow legislator asked what the process was. This is a new legislator. Uh, for getting their bill introduced in committee. Well, the speaker's the one who uh, appoints a bill to a committee, and then generally um, a committee will at least give an individual a time to present their, their, uh, their bill. Um, and when I asked uh, my chair uh, last week uh, what that process was during the uh, Zooming process and so on, it was said that uh, with such limited time um, that that's, that's not going to happen uh, this year and and to me what that tells me is uh, you know the majority pretty much has their agenda planned out and that uh, any of the bills that are on the wall uh, that that they have no interest in and that's generally the way it is anyway but uh, you know they're not uh, individuals aren't even going to get an opportunity to uh, to uh, present their their, their bills uh, that leads me to another question I didn't even have written down but uh, do you guys feel that um Chittenden County seems to be overrepresented. <laughs> well, <laughs> that might be an understatement. Well, yeah, and, and the, the problem is, of course, and, and actually we're going through this again in the next year here in my committee, um, is the reapportionment. And oh, please explain. I haven't heard about that yet. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so reapportionment uh, by, you know, federal law, you have to be represented by... Um, or you have to represent, representatives have to represent basically the, an equal number of, of uh, residents. Okay. And, and that number for each representative is around 4,200. Um, and it's required by law. When we, I was on GovOps uh, 10 years ago when we went through it. Um, it's another reason that I asked to serve on GovOps again uh, so that I could hopefully um, help out and, and uh, show folks the pitfalls and, and all that's involved, but um, it sounds like the census uh, numbers aren't in yet, which is a concern, because we have a certain timeline that we have to go by. Mm -hmm. There's a legislative apportionment board that's working on it now, and uh, once they come up with their, basically, maps and, and what they're looking at, uh, we take over, and, and next year, uh, we're supposed to have a new, uh, uh, new map for uh, 
districts in, in, in Vermont. Yeah, if I can ahead. add to that, uh, we in rural Vermont are losing people. Right. Yep. And as we lose people, we also lose representation. Mm -hmm. And we're up against it this year because in, in, in Essex County, for example, the last figures I saw, there were down minus 1%. Caledonia and Orleans were kind of zero, had, new, had, had, had more or less flattened out. But, uh, but what we are facing now is the, uh, with the shrinkage of our population in Essex County and not gaining in, in the other two, the Northeast Kingdom, I think, is, is, danger, is dangerously close to losing or having to get even larger in order to have uh, retain its uh, senators, its number of senators. And, and it's really too bad that when they put the Senate together that they didn't allow uh, each county to have two senators. And uh, maybe if, they, if, you, if you wanted to stay with 30, one on the west side of the Greens and one on the east side of the Greens, mm -hmm. the Green Mountains, that is. I, uh, but I, re as Mark says, reapportionment is going to be. Uh, we used to have a, an old Northeast Kingdom guy who used to head the uh, uh, the government operations committee in the House, and that's where it starts. That's where they start to draw the map. He always started up in the Northeast <laughs> Kingdom, <laughs> so we were able to, you know, hold on to what we had. But we, who who knows what, how that's going to play out this time? Well, isn't it? Um, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I know you're. you're People are represented by their representatives according to their population. Now, it, aren't the senators that same way? Doesn't doesn't Chittenden County have a lot more senators than two? The 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 senates are are just uh, uh, based on uh, you know the the counties and and so it's it's different. Yeah, they definitely you know because there's only thirty senators. Mm -hmm. um, so so again, it's it's based a little differently. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's right. I, I don't know what the number <coughs> is either, but the uh, Senate is is, com is composed differently than the House. It's right. And, and the one issue that, that we are going to hopefully look at uh, this next year is there is a, uh, a sixth Senate district over in Chittenden County, and we're looking to hopefully split that up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, which, you know, that, that is, is pretty concerning to a lot of folks, that there'd be one district that's represented by six senators. Yeah, uh, that uh, that was that was a, a point of contention that I've had. I mean, Vermont has two senators, the same as Texas or California, two senators, and, and that's it. But uh, the uh, the western side of the state seems to have more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they're bigger. They're bigger counties like Rutland County, say for example, and Chittenden County. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. I think Franklin and maybe even um, Addison you. might also. But anyways, here's another email question that came in. Could you comment, and if you don't know the answer, that's fine. I mean, some of these, these things uh, are not in your committee. Could you comment on the recent hearing by the, on the report by ANR on landfill siting, which was requested by the House Natural Resources Committee? The goal was to determine if there could be another landfill sited in a geologically safe area away from wetlands or water bodies and closer to locations generating most of the solid waste. Yes, that's come to my committee. In fact, oh, uh, good. We went out of our way to get um, Peggy Stevens, who represents the uh, the advocate group known as Dump, yep, uh, to come in and testify to us. Uh, and the study that we had uh, required A and I to produce uh, was to, to why it was not feasible. We wanted a feasibility study on opening another land, land landfill uh, outside of the Northeast Kingdom. And uh, Dump picked up the uh, range from that. And also, their best, their, I think uh, the most salient point they're making is Coventry is very close to, a, uh, to, to the lake. Yeah. And you are in an area where all the water flows north. And although we've got reassurance after reassurance that the uh, liners will hold, they will not leak. Uh, but we all know things happen that no one for, no one for, foresees, and it's just why even have it possible? Why even have it possible that that lake can be contaminated? It, it's an international body of water. Many of the uh, Canadians get their drinking water from Champlain. They are very concerned. There's been a mass hearing last uh, last fall, I believe right. it was, yeah. uh, or maybe in winter. I guess a year ago. And where we had a lot of people come in, and we talked and talked, 
and uh, it uh, you know it 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 just seems like uh, like it's one of those deals in the Northeast Kingdom. It easily it's way it's out of sight. <laughs> it disappears. People are not aware of what's happening, and and we're doing what we can to try to make this front and center so that people say, hey, maybe it's not such a great idea. Let's let's look at other possibilities. And the study, quite frankly, was 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 in my mind uh, was uh, was incomplete. It was kind of put together in a hurry. I don't believe there was much money put into it. And uh, basically, it just defended what had already been done. They didn't deal with it uh, in terms of uh, the admissions of going into the air from all these trucks running up, uh, running up uh, garbage from other uh, from the rest of the state. The impact on our on our on our highways. Uh, the idea that uh, the, the kingdom now is this kind of place where you could dump your trash because, after all, so many people live up here and there's no not in my backyard kind of philosophy uh, uh, comes into play. So, yes, I, I'm glad to hear the question and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to keep that issue alive in, in my committee. We, we've asked for more more testimony on it, but whether the chair goes along with that or not remains to be seen. The chair at any committee is all powerful. They determine what the agenda is. And uh, it's the majority party who usually chairs the committees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. Um, here's another email question I got in. What are your thoughts on the Reform and Modernization Act? I'm sorry, let me try that again. What are your thoughts on the Reform and Modern Modernization Act of Act 250? And what do you think of the governor's executive order to eliminate the district commissions and replace it with centralized with a centralized board in Montpelier? Well, for me, uh, that, it looks like the Senate is, is the one who's been taking that up, and maybe Paul has some insight in, in his committee as well on that. But uh, I'm, I'm not real uh, familiar with, with uh, what all that executive order is looking to do at this point. Uh, yeah, as I <laughs> told you earlier, we... Uh, um, I've been involved with 250 ever since they uh, decided it was when it turned 50 years old they were going to have a look at, or, uh, with the idea of updating the uh, 250 and we went around the state I was a part of a commission that went around the state and took testimony at public hearings as to what people had to say about Act 250 why they thought it was working why they thought it, what was wrong with it and um, we put out this bill or that this, from the commission came this bill and we started taking testimony within the uh, state house two years ago and there was a lot in the bill I did not like I, I, it was not I thought one of the problems with 250 that, that it did not give enough deference to uh, the working lands loggers and, and farmers I wanted to see a little more flexibility in the law I wanted to see a little more local uh, application so that you know the uh, Northeast Kingdom is not like is not like uh, Addison County and uh, that and and we had this terrific fight and the fight started with the second uh, year of the session. The governor and the VNRC, the Vermont Natural Resources uh, Council, which is a, uh, a lobbyist, an environmental lobbyist, came in and wanted to replace the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, com the nine regional commissions. And we fought that all through last year. Finally got rid of it. Uh, and when we came back this year, here it is again in the form of a, of a governor order. An executive order and it was just so dis discouraging and disappointing to think that we were going to have to plow that ground again I mean I uh, Dean Dave Davis was a Republican governor at the time 250 was incorporated he saw the need for it because Vermont was losing its open spaces and he said the district commissions are the, are the heart and soul of this 250 act it's where the people have an opportunity to say what they want their neighborhoods to look like where they live the, the, the decisions were location-based with this, with this uh, professional board, that's not going to be the case. And there's many, many questions that go along with that. But uh, I'm, I, 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 I don't really want to take up all the time, but I, I, just as an, uh, an addition, there's another 250 bill now that just came into our committee, uh, like a 40, 45, 46-page bill. I haven't studied it yet, uh, but I know it also it does retain the district commission. So... We're, obviously, we're going to have that argument again. Mm -hmm. I believe Dean Davis was our governor back in the early 70s, wasn't he? He was. Yeah, I, I, I vaguely remember him. I remember I was, back then, you see, you had to be 21 to vote. 
So I remember vaguely sort of that. I remember Phil Hoff, and then I remember, yeah. you know, like that. But anyways, um, as I'm driving up the interstate highway this, this past weekend, I, I went down to visit um, friends in White River Junction. <clears throat> I noticed that every, every off-ramp has a sign that said, if you come in from out of state, you must quarantine for two weeks. And it's at every off-ramp that I saw. Do you feel this is a, a good use of our money to put all these signs up? Or do you think we could spend it better somewhere else? Or maybe this was federally mandated? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure, Terry. I know that uh, a lot of my constituents have talked about those signs and how permanent they look. So let's hope that's not the case. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been mentioned to me as well as seeing those signs. Well, let's hope a year from now there'll be no need for those signs and they'll be down. Uh, I, I, I don't know what the cost is to uh, install them, and uh, I hope to see them gone as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the exact figure was, but somebody quoted a figure like $600,000 <coughs> for all these signs. You know, not only making them, but putting them up and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, uh, at, this, at this time, do you guys feel any sort of tension going on between legislators, whether it's within our our area in the Northeast Kingdom or even on the other the other uh, half of the state? <clears throat> oh, sure. There's there's the usual tension. There's a little more tension because, again, of, of COVID and Zooming. Uh, you, you, like I said originally, you know, you need to, you need to know your uh, colleagues on a personal basis and you can't, you can't do it through Zoom. So, right. Um, yeah. Well, tension's part of the it's the nature of the beast in politics. There's always tension. And I think it's probably driven to a new height in the last few years. I think more and more uh, po politics have become increasingly polarized. Um, and uh, what happened on a national level is kind, of, is kind of souping down into the states, I think. I think there's a lot more polarization in now than it was when I first went in 2014. Uh, and I, you know, and a, and a lot of, and the issues are, are difficult to resolve. They just are. Uh, a lot of times, it's not so much party issues in Vermont; it's whether or not you live in uh, in uh, in urban Vermont or rural Vermont. Uh, you know, look at broadband, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, I, I, I in my my broadband is so poor that it goes in and out, in and out. Uh, it's really uh, a, a, an additional obstacle that I have to work under, and it's just, you know, and there's no really end in sight. It's going to take a federal electrification, uh, <laughs> something along those lines, to bring broadband into the rural areas because it's expensive, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, so I like to shut my video off anyway, Paul. You know well, I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I a lot of times do, a lot, but a lot of times I, I, lose, I lose the whole thing. I know, I know, it's, it gets bad. And uh, like right now, my wife and I are both Zooming. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I really don't have a lot of bandwidth to do that. And uh, if I can just elaborate a little too, uh, um, what I've seen is um, there's always been people that disagree with you on one issue mm -hmm. or another, but now it's become pretty visceral. Uh, oh, yeah. Whether it's, yeah. Whether it's an email that, uh, I mean, used to maybe years back, you know, say that they disagreed with me <coughs> and here's the reasons or whatever. Now, I'm pretty much called every name in the book, um, and uh, you you see it in print, you see it, uh, you know, on email, and uh, it's uh, it it gets to you after a while. It really does. I imagine so. Yeah. Not as fun as it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, gentlemen, uh, how can people contact you? Like emails? Is that the best way? Emails best. It's it's any legislator. So it's their first initial, last name, at ledge state.vt.us. Okay, I will make sure that I put up a graphic at the end. Great. Like, as a matter of fact, right about at this point, I will put up both of the, your yep. uh, emails so yep. people can get in touch with you. Uh, I want to say that this half hour has shot by really fast, and I want to thank you for, for being here. I, um, this is like the first show that's going to be uh, done, I think, in three weeks. I have two other people coming in, and I'm sure. not sure who great. it is. Yeah. But anyways, it was great having you here. I learned a lot, and, and, I, and I know our viewers did. So thank you. Thank yeah, well, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hopefully we've set the bar high. <laughs> <laughs> this is Terry DeFazio for Dial It Up saying tune in sometime and we'll catch you later. Bye.